eternity, eternity now, God has had me preaching on Revelation and teaching about it as well quite a bit over the last two years. I have gone line by line, verse by verse through the entire book with preaching, and now we are finishing up that in the teaching mode on Wednesday nights. I am not by nature obsessed by prophecy. I don't get into speculative theories of the end times. I stick with what the Bible says. And I have noticed, though, however, on our social media that we have had some messages and lessons that have been responded to by folks saying that they are Christian, but trying to explain away, deny much of the supernatural element that is in the scriptures regarding the end of days. And even the idea that God does miracles in our midst right now. I'm going to address those false teachings today. As the Lord's put it in my heart that we are about to see some significant supernatural activity upon the earth and in the heavens above, even before we go up in the rapture, which could be at any moment. We'll find out more in my message today, our supernatural God, Miracles then, miracles now. From Acts, the second chapter, verses 17 to 21, as well as other scriptures. Well, Father God, I thank you so much for the chance to bring this message to the people near and far. I pray, Lord God, that you'll anoint me to preach, and you'll also anoint all of the hearers of this word. Father God, I pray that we would receive from the Spirit what you are saying to the churches now. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. Amen. Now, the reason. I believe that God wants me to be explaining this today as we are very, very late in the game, so to speak, as far as time is concerned. This era is about to wrap up. The next major event on the calendar, eschatologically, the end of days, is the rapture, in which I will not be able to give you any more messages or any more teachings. I'll just have to leave it on YouTube as long as that stays up. I have already established through my message, a uh, moment any second, about the signs of Jesus' return and whether they're being fulfilled, the rapture and the different views of it, that we could go up at any time, even before I finish this message today. If this place that I am behind in this pulpit is unoccupied here in a few minutes, you will know where I am, and that is with the Lord. Praise God. And I do believe that the Lord is saying that we are going to see some supernatural activity even before the great exit of the church. Here's how Peter put it on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 17 to 21. He was quoting the Old Testament prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs of the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God in the name of Jesus. I get excited. Just talking about it. Now, some people say, oh, yeah, we've been in the last days ever since Jesus came to walk the earth. Well, no, no, actually, that is not true. The term here in this passage for last days is eschatos, just like that word I used a moment ago, that 25 cent word eschatological. That is the study of last things. That word uh, eschatos means it's the very, very extreme end of a period of time. And so we are at that extreme end today, my friends. The word of God about Jesus' return is being fulfilled. We are seeing perplexity of nations. We are seeing ethnic violence. We are seeing lawlessness like you can't believe in America and beyond. Uh, it is an incredible time. We're seeing people overcome with the delusion that they believe the lie because they did not have regard for the truth. The Lord God Jehovah says in his word, and thus they shall perish with Antichrist. There also are some errant theories in Christianity about when the rapture is going to happen, if and if there's going to be a rapture happening. Eternity now and I are in the mainstream of evangelical thought. Um, the true church, all those who are born again, 
being taken up in a moment in time, the next major event on God's calendar for 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18. It'll be in the blink of an eye, in a moment in time. We're going to be changed from corruption to incorruption, and we will be with the Lord, meeting him and all the other believers of all time in the air, and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. <laughs> now, some evangelicals think that the church is raptured at the midpoint of the tribulation, when Antichrist exalts himself as God in the rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Uh, that is described in 2 Thessalonians 2. This is going to be the time when he not only demands worship of everybody on pain of death, you're also going to have to get the mark of the beast to be able to buy, sell, or survive. But yet there are others who almost fully spiritualize the rapture and tribulation, including the three major rounds of God's judgment, seven woes each, that are described in Revelation. They will ravage the earth and those on it. Many of these people do not believe that there will be a literal 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ upon the earth with all of his saints from glory. But it is clearly taught in Revelation 20. Also, they don't believe that there is going to be a specific person who is the beast, the Antichrist, though it is described in Revelation 13 clearly. Or that there will be a literal New Jerusalem where all believers are going to live forever with Christ and that it is not of this earth though those points are clearly taught in Revelation 21 and 22. These folks call themselves amillennialists, and before, historically, there have been some good preachers among them, such as the late R.C. Sproul and Bobby Schuler today. I know Bobby Schuler some. He wrote the foreword to my two books. Bobby is a wonderful, humble servant of the Lord. He admits he does a major on eschatology, I remember I said, well, I take it literally. He said, well, I think it's figurative, but what do I know? I studied that 15, 20 years ago. So is that wonderful? And here he is a famous TV preacher. <laughs> However, lately, a number of these folks have taken to social and other media to berate those of us who believe the Bible simply as written, <laughs> claiming to be superior to us in intellect and understanding, although really they are only regurgitating contradictory man-made doctrine that is found nowhere in the scriptures. For example, someone said on our Facebook page this past week that Christ is reigning on earth at the fifth and sixth trumpets, and the trumpet judgments are the same as the bold judgments. Well, the two realms cannot be the same. The trumpet judgments are the middle of the three. The bowls are the last of the three. In the trumpet judgments, there are parts of the earth, one third, or in most cases, that are going to be destroyed. And then also the creatures in them, one third of the earth will be destroyed. But in the bold judgments, all of the seas, for example, are turned to blood, and all of the creatures in them die. Back in the trumpets, it's only one third. So how can these be the same round of judgment described? And also, how could Christ be reigning on earth when the collapse of all of the cities is to come yet in the judgment of God? Antichrist is requiring the mark of the beast, and our Lord has yet to fight Armageddon. When Revelation 19 states clearly that he is going to finally emerge from heaven on a white horse, and he is going to lead all of us, all believers of all time, into battle with him at Armageddon, a real place, in the real Holy Land, on the real earth, that is governed by a real God. <laughs> this kind of teaching that I'm correcting is in danger of incurring God's wrath, as the Apostle John preserved forever in Revelation 22, verses 18 to 19, in the last handful of verses of Holy Scripture. It says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the, this book of prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. That's pretty serious, friends. Don't add or subtract. Try to explain away the word of God. It will not end well for you. This kind of mistaken doctrine is an outgrowth of teaching by some preachers saying that there are no more miracles. There's no more of the sign gifts 
and as they talk about them as discussed from 1 Corinthians 12. B.B. Warfield was the first major figure of the modern era to bring them into question. He insisted that miracles were only needed to prove that the gospel was true. Following in his footsteps, John MacArthur says unequivocally, all sign gifts ceased with the time of the 12 apostles, and that there is no way to test what is the Holy Spirit and not today. He even convened a conference he called Strange Fire to try to paint as heretics those people who believe that the Bible is right and that these gifts still exist. He said, quote, Jesus not only had the ability to do miracles, but so did the apostles and prophets, the New Testament writers, the ones who were the heartbeat of the early church. Why? Because there was no written word to corroborate their preaching. And so God gave them miraculous abilities. That is not at all scriptural. First of all, we have from the Lord the witness from the Holy Spirit. He witnesses to our spirit that we are sons of God. Romans 8 says, so we do have a way to know what is the Holy Spirit. As far as strange fire, Mr. MacArthur is a lot closer to it than the charismatic and Pentecostals are if they're following what the scripture says. They're not trying to explain it away as he is. Also, they were preaching from the Old Testament. That corroborated what they were saying. Do you remember what is said about those who were in Berea? That they were more fair-minded than the Thessalonians. They would listen to Paul, then they'd go back, and they would search the scrolls and see if what he was saying was in them from the Old Testament. <laughs> there is but one mention of miracles confirming in the New Testament. That is in Mark 16, 20, which says of the apostles, they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Well, not only is that thought by most scholars to be a late addition to the scripture with a few verses before it, all it says is the apostles preached Christ, and then out of compassion and love and the power of God healed people. It wasn't that they felt they had to have their message proven out by miracles, just like Jesus Christ didn't feel that he had to have such. Jesus never did a miracle to prove himself. In fact, he resisted everyone who demanded of him a sign including temple leaders, King Herod, many of his disciples, and more. Very typical of this is Matthew 16, verses 1 to 4. The Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. And you know what the sign of Jonah is, don't you? Three days and nights in the heart of the earth. That was the time that he spent getting ready for that greatest miracle of all, after being crucified, after suffering, bleeding, and dying, coming back to life by the power of God. And he reigns yet today, and I can't wait to follow him on the white horse out of heaven. Praise God in the name of Jesus. So when did Christ do miracles? When someone not trying to test him needed them. For example, he turned water into wine at the wedding at Cana, his first miracle that was recorded. In that, he didn't even want to do it necessarily. His mother asked him to help out this couple who had wine running out of their wedding. It was important that they were taking care of their guests for this feast well, and they would be embarrassed. Well, Jesus got up. There were six gallons, there were six jars that had a couple of hundred pounds worth of water in them each. And he prayed over them and he said, go ahead and sink it to the fellow who's running the feast. And the fellow said, boy, you've left the good wine till now. Usually they use this up first when nobody has any kind of an impairment. But no, he did it for them to save them embarrassed. Also, he blessed Mary and Martha who raised Lazarus from the dead. He saw the angst on their faces. He saw how much turmoil that they were in. In fact, John 11.35, the shortest verse in all of Scripture says Jesus wept. 
And so he brought Lazarus back to life. The man was bound hand and foot, probably with about 100 pounds of spices. And this was according to the custom of that era for the Jews. And he comes out somehow walking and being able to respond to Jesus, say, Lazarus, come here. It literally is Lazarus outside. <laughs> Fortunately, someone loosed it so that he was able to walk a little more easily and then testify, yes, Jesus has brought people back from the dead. Also, he healed the paralytic. Why did he do that? He didn't know the paralytic, but he saw that the paralytic's friends believed in him, that he could heal their friend who was suffering. And so they went out on the roof of that place where Jesus was teaching, preaching, and ministering. They took off the eaves, and they lowered down their friend on his mat so that Christ could minister to him. And oh, did he minister? He was able to rise and walk, taking his mat up. Praise God. He did it out of compassion and out of people's faith in him that was appropriate. So why did Jesus resist? using miracles to persuade people to follow him because God was seeking change in heart and character from them. If Jesus reached them solely on the basis of miraculous powers and works, well, they would still have an unsaved value system. They may still have their pride and arrogance, and they would follow the next powerful leader, the next charismatic one, the next one who would slap their backs and give them something who came along. Christ taught humility compassion, forgiveness, and grace. To the merciful, he was merciful, and to the proud, he was convicted. No apostle did miracles on demand of a sign either. We see throughout the New Testament that Paul and the others healed people through God's power. But they were clear in proclaiming the Lord's salvation and kingdom with miracles following as they ministered to people in love and compassion of the Holy Spirit. Here's an example of how people can turn if we depend on miracles to stir faith in them. This is from Acts, the 28th chapter, verses 2 to 6. After Paul and 275 others survived shipwreck and washed up on Malta, the natives showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. From demon to God in just a few minutes. That's the world, isn't it, my friend? Well, you might say, well, what about when Paul said that all the miracles and all those other mighty works are going to cease? Well, I'm glad you asked that because he didn't actually say that. People usually try to draw this from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 12. They read, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. But then I shall know, just as I also am known. Isn't that beautiful? The cessationist, that is, the miracles and such have gone away, point of view, is that the perfect is the Bible that Paul is not writing, that in part are the miraculous. 
and we shall know just as we are known when the book of Scripture is completed. However, if you look into the Koine Greek, the original language of verses 10 to 12 here, this is how it reads literally about when these sign gifts cease. When I have developed full moral character, completing my spiritual journey, that which I only have partially, whether natural or miraculous, will end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I did away with the things of a child. Now we look at the riddle of life from several different angles to try to solve it. But later, I will be able to understand it clearly. Now I am coming to understand through my realizations. But then I will know by personal experience, just as I have been known by personal experience. He is saying the gifts cease only when we complete our spiritual journey and develop full moral character. That is when we go to be with the Lord who has known us completely. He made our frame. He put Adam and Eve on this earth and we are descendants of theirs. He also knit together our souls and knew us in the womb. He put that soul into that body. He knows everything about us spiritually and physically. We'll go to see him by rapture, by death, or by second coming. And then all of these things, the miracles, the tongues, all the other kinds of signs and wonders, they'll be gone because Christ is there and he's ruling and reigning and we will ever be with the Lord of glory. Isn't that beautiful? A friend, I'm going to warn you about following teaching and preaching of people who discount the supernatural component of Christianity. I once belonged to an independent Baptist church, the kind that only uses the King James Version. Well, those folks are usually dead on the miraculous for today, but I got to the one pastor and one church constitution that allowed them still to be functioning. The church yet has this statement on its website. A Bible Baptist is one who believes in a supernatural Bible which tells of a supernatural Christ, who had a supernatural birth, who spoke supernatural words, who performed supernatural miracles, who lived a supernatural life, who died a supernatural death, who rose in supernatural power, who ascended in supernatural splendor, who intercedes as a supernatural priest, and who will one day return in supernatural glory to establish a supernatural kingdom. Upon the earth, Praise God, in the name of Jesus, true words have never been spoken. <laughs> if we believe in a God who only does what we would do and understand, then we have made human power and reasoning into our Lord, and we do not know the true one, Yahweh, nor his Christ. I'm also warning you of people who believe that God is a miracle in it. We know from 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. In Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14, the false prophet, Antichrist's demonic sidekick, quote, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast, who is wounded by the sword and yet lived. The terms of these passages for signs and the other mighty works, miraculous of God, are the same ones used for God's true miracles. Only with this Greek word at the end, pseudos, like pseudonym, a false name for someone, pseudopigrapha, false writings masquerading as scripture, Pseudos literally means of falsehood. And so these will be false, fake works leading us away from Jesus Christ and toward the devil. Now, have I seen miracles, you might ask? Yes, unequivocally. I know that they still happen, for I have seen them. I have witnessed money multiplied 100 times. I gave $5,050 to a startup Christian college. It became exactly $505,000. In five years, <laughs> I've laid hands on painful knees and had them heal without pain so that folks who are senior citizens 20 years later are still doing heavy work without difficulty. 
I've seen homosexuals go straight, drug addicts come clean, and exact prophecies of time and material come to pass. But by far the greatest miracle I have ever seen is the work of God in hearts, souls, and lives that people seek the living Lord and be saved and changed. And I am in that number myself. As an atheist and agnostic, I got a little pocket green New Testament Psalms and Proverbs from the Gideons. It was actually a Gideon auxiliary member, an elderly lady, who gave it to me in the Texas Panhandle. The Elevate Slip Course, if anyone was out there from the Panhandle of Texas today. I was headed for hell at that time, but the next stop for me is heaven. <laughs> Thank God, and God is fully responsible for it. We have seen people from children to the most elderly, from 90 years old on down to little children, saved in eternity now in its ministry near and far. It is a wonderful blessing to be used of Almighty God, to bring his truth, his peace, his grace to people, their everlasting salvation. Praise God in the name of Jesus. So when will God do miracles for us right now? First, when we've done all we can do and prayed in faith that God will supply what we cannot. We have a great example of this in Acts 12, verses 5 to 7 and 12 to 16. Peter was kept in prison. The constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that is to execute him, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the doors were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hand. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced, Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Friends, they couldn't have broken Peter out of that prison. There was no way that those guards were going to let him get in. Ah, but the Holy Ghost doesn't have to have any kind of stopping from anything of man. He can go anywhere, anytime. <laughs> Praise God. Second, God does miracles when we're obedient to him, and in faith we do what he says. A great example of this is with Paul and his salvation, baptism, and restoration of sight in Acts 9, verses 11 to 18. The Lord said to him, Ananias, arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me here that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. That shows the depths of his commitment already, because Jews were not baptized in those days, unless they were converts from pagans. And here, Paul, also known as Saul before that conversion mainly, was a Pharisee of the Pharisees by his own word in the scripture. He had studied under one of the most famous teachers in all of Jewish history, Gamaliel. He was known as a fire-breathing, Jehovah-worshipping, 
temple-keeping Jew. And yet he humbled himself to be baptized like pagans were the stage before. Third, God does miracles when we haven't even asked. But the Lord wants to bless us in a way that only we will really know fully. This is in Luke 5, verses 4 to 6. He, Jesus, said to Simon Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. <laughs> then fourth and last, when God has led us into a situation where he must come through, so our faith in him will be built. This happened with the children of Israel as they went out of captivity in the land of Egypt and were going to the Holy Land. Exodus 13, verses 17 and 18 says, When Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, though that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. He led them right into a place where there was only one road in. And of course, you know that Pharaoh came to pursue the children of Israel. The Pharaoh was a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, and he was about to drown for having challenged the Lord God Jehovah one time too many. But that road was occupied with the Egyptians coming in. Then there were mountains on another side, and the final side was the sea. And that was no little pond. It was 600 feet deep on average and 11 miles to the other side. And there were probably a million or more Jews there. What in the world are they going to do? They cried out to Moses and said, have you brought us out into the wilderness so that we'll die? And our carcasses will be scattered out here? Ah, but he had the faith of God. And he said, stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. For these Egyptians you see today, you shall see no more forever. And here's what happened in Exodus 14, verses 21 and 22. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went out into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. <laughs> One of the greatest miracles in all of history, second only. I would say to Jesus Christ himself rising from the grave. Friend, we have six takeaways today. Number one, God is supernatural. He has made everything we see, including we ourselves, and he continues to work miracles today. God is supernatural. He has made everything we see, and he continues to work miracles today. There is no Credible case in scripture for the ending of the miraculous gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12 or in any other place in the New Testament. Number two, we are on the lip of the rapture and the tribulation. Both of these will have many supernatural works and we're likely to see more miraculous ones coming along before then. We are on the lip of the rapture and the tribulation. Both these will have many supernatural works, and we're likely to see other miraculous ones before then. Our government and others are leading us with crazy behavior. They have the delusion they believe the lie. Inflation producing and spending, cutting off our energy supply, and the open borders in a time of terrorism, drug abuse, and war. We could go up in the rapture anytime, so brace for the unexpected. And if you're saved, or the exciting. <laughs> Number three, our millennialists try to explain away most of the miraculous today and in the end times, but their arguments hit scripture against itself. This is clearly error. Our millennialists try to explain away most of the miraculous today and in the end times, but their arguments hit scripture against itself. This is clearly error. Now, there are some saved our millennialists. Bobby Schuler, for example, who has a wonderful ministry with the Hour of Power in California. 
but he also is one with a good attitude about the end times. And when we differ with somebody about these, we need to say, hey, uh, it's going to be interesting. It probably won't be exactly as either of us thinks. We want to be humble. We want to be gracious with brothers and sisters. But when we have people who come shaking their finger at us and say, hey, you don't know the scriptures. When we are actually proclaiming the scriptures and they are giving us man-made gobbledygook, we don't have to just say, oh, well, that's okay. No, they're wrong. It's what it is. When you call the word of God into question as written, and you have fanciful explanations of men, you are in error, and you should be told so. Number four, those denying supernatural activity today say Jesus and his apostles did miracles to prove they were of God. So those were extended with them. That is wrong and clearly error. Those denying supernatural activity today say Jesus and his apostles did miracles to prove they were of God. So those works ended with them. That is clearly error. It is false. It contradicts the Lord of glory and all his glorious apostles. Christ in his own did miracles out of love, compassion, and service. They never did one on demand for anybody and never will. Number five, God is still doing miracles today. God is still doing miracles today. These come when we pray in faith, having done all that we know to do, when we are obedient to God and doing what he says, when we haven't asked, but he wants to bless us in a way that only we will really understand completely. And when he's led us into a situation where we or he must act to build our faith. <laughs> We all have a Red Sea moment, don't we? In fact, there was a good book called Red Sea Rules out a few years ago. But once we go through those Red Seas, we know that the Lord can do anything. And friend, again, if he's changed your heart, if he's changed your life, you know that that's a miracle. And it truly is. I was so far from the Lord at almost 26 years of age. I was a very liberal, I was a successful journalist, very liberal, atheist, agnostic, raised in a very liberal, believe nothing, do nothing church except for good works. And they thought works from Salem. Zero background in biblical Christianity. Here I am preaching the word of God to every race on demand, ordained in an overwhelmingly African American denomination, which has sound theology. They believe in miracles. Also, by a independent church, and then by an interdenominational county ministers association. Isn't that amazing? Preaching over 20 different denominations from Free Lutheran to Word of Faith Pentecostal. I'm not Free Lutheran, nor am I Word of Faith Pentecostal, but friends, I'll go anywhere I can preach Jesus from the Scripture. Number six, and the last. At the same time, even as God does miracles today, we must not presume upon him and think he does miracles every moment. At the same time, we must not presume upon God and think he does miracles every moment. We need to ask him in his spirit, not our selfishness, pride, or arrogance. Only those miracles pointing to God and his Christ are of them. Antichrist and the false prophet will do lying signs and wonders, and deceive virtually the entire world. It's going to be a horrible time when they come to power by the present count of Earth. Four billion people dead of starvation, of wars, of lawlessness, all of these kinds of calamities. We're going to have World War III and perhaps World War IV. And people will say, by and large, give me that Mark of the beast, I'm happy to worship him just so I have something to eat and drink, a roof over my head, and clothes to wear. And their soul will be damned to hell forever. There is no repentance for The Bible is very clear. This is a different era. The era of grace and mercy at its maximum, at its highest level, is ending. It will be complete when we go up in the rapture at any moment. And then you will have to stay with the Lord and not take the mark of the beast and also be saved of Jesus Christ to be able to go to heaven. Otherwise, you'll be in hell forever. There's only two places, my friend. I want to ask you today, have you experienced the miracle of salvation? 
If not, I want to say that I was where you are today, some years ago, as I was just mentioning, 1994, I'm going to say. I did not believe in anything that could not be be tested, that, that could not be proven, that could not be shown. I said, there is nothing supernatural that we really know of. There are only intelligent men and women, powerful forces and countries and the rest. But you see, then that Bible, that scripture, that holy word of God came. And I realized that there was a supernatural God. He did supernatural works, making the earth and everything in it of all time. By him. It hangs together even yet today, as Colossians 1 says. And it shall until these heavens and earth pass away, and a new heaven and a new earth that we show on our very sign outside this building are in place. The good news, though, today, literally, the gospel, is that you can be saved. You can be spared the tribulation. You can go up in the rapture even now. You could be eternally with Jesus Christ and avoid hell which burns forever, forever, forever alone together. And outer darkness, but like you're in a furnace, as Jesus said, where the worm does not die, your body is yet alive. It's a resurrected body that you never saw. And the fire is not quenched, the torturous heat, privation, loneliness are forever. There are four essentials to salvation. Number one, we've got to repent of our sin. All of us, including me, have done things that are wrong, that are against God, and we fail to do things we should have. We need to say, I'm sorry, God, forgive me, please. And he surely will, in the name of Jesus. We also need to confess faith in Jesus Christ. He is the only way, truth, and life. There is no way to the Father but by him. He himself said in John 14, 6, don't say he didn't claim to be God because he should be dead several times. But he lived sinlessly, the only man to do so on the face of the earth and the only one who ever shall. And he is the way that we're going to be saved. We believe that Christ rose in body and in spirit the third day in the tomb. If he stays in that tomb, we do not have a faith that's real. But he did rise, and we do have one we can count on. And then we follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We believe in him We take up our cross daily, as he told us to do, and we follow him. And sometimes we stumble and fall. And what we do is we repent. We say, oh, Lord God, I sinned, forgive me. And it's gone. And we get up by the power of God and we keep going. But we have decided to follow Jesus. We're walking to the cross, my friends. All of us who have come to Christ are predestined to be conformed to the image of the living Lord. I'm going to pray a prayer here, some repentance and faith, to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You can repeat after me what I'm saying. And this will be your entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And you just keep pursuing God in these steps of discipleship that I'm about to give you. And then you will be in heaven, my friend, and I will see you there one day soon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I repent of my sin. Please forgive me. I confess faith in Jesus Christ that he died that I might live. I believe he rose the third day in the tomb in body and in spirit. I will follow him As Lord and Savior, repenting should I fall. Come into my heart, Lord God, and save me. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so be it. That is what that means. That little good four-letter word from Hebrew. I mean, so be it. So only say it. If you believe it. (laughs) What's been said? Oh, isn't it wonderful to know Jesus? Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how he's proven me over, I've proven him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Once we are saved, friend, what do we do? Well, we need to get baptized in water. 
It doesn't matter so much how much water is in there, although we do it by immersion because that's what they did in Bible days. That's the way Jesus was baptized. But we need to do it on the right side of the cross. I was baptized in a liberal church. I was uh, given a little sprinkling when I was an infant. Made no difference. I just knew I was wet. Sure. But when we go and we do it as an adult, it is a public profession of faith that we have decided to follow Jesus. It's not just in the mind, it's also in the body. We read the Bible. That Bible has 7,500 promises to you. Are you aware of that? That's one, almost one for every hour in the year. Yes, I said it right, an hour in the year, 7,500. But you can only possess them if you know about them and read the Bible. Pray. How do we receive those promises? If we don't have peace, how do we have peace? Well, we ask God for peace. Oh, Lord God. Keep me in perfect peace. My mind stayed on you, for I trust in you. That's Isaiah 26, 3. In Jesus' name, amen. And God will do it because the word that God has given us shall not return void. It shall do what God has designed it to do, as he says in Isaiah 55. We come to church. Come to here. And we would be more than happy to see you at 5 p.m. Mountain on Saturday. All across the world on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the rest of it. And you'll also be able to see tapes on our YouTube channel and Facebook as well. You need to have a church body. You need to have teaching that are sound from the word of God. You need to believe that it is your guidebook in this life and that it is without error. And it is the way, the truth, and the life's love letter to you to live by. And that Jesus is the only way. And, and that we need to love each other. As the Church of Jesus Christ, it's not a bunch of Lone Ranger Christians who don't see each other any other time. Talk to each other. No, I call up people and pray with them on the phone. I have coffee with them. I email them. Friends, it's time for us to actually be that church that can storm the gates of hell, as Jesus told us. To. Also, we fellowship with other believers. Taking that time builds relationship. The thing that's the problem in America is people don't have relationships. With each other, even in a political vein, everybody's yelling at each other and screaming, do a you're a liar, you're a liar, when they're the liar and they're the one doing what they're accusing the other person. That's our government. But what we need to do is love each other, respect each other, and come together, pray, work, and do the works of God, and preach the word of God so that people will be saved and spared in eternal hell. Then also pursue personal relationship the only God there's ever been or ever will be. Friends, he has been gracious, he's been kind, he's been long-suffering for all these thousands of years of human history. It's right about time of judgment. He's been delaying it, actually, for a long time, I really believe. He's been wanting people to be saved. He doesn't want anyone to perish, Second Peter 3, 9 says, but he will allow it because it's according to his word. Why is the path that leads destruction and many find it but narrow is the way that leads to life and few go there by if you don't give your life to christ and you don't follow him you don't go to heaven you're not saved and yeah there's a lot of people in the churches and i've met a number of them and been the pastor of churches were selling there that are false apostles they're false disciples they're not really of god even though their names on our church roll they're as much with the devil as uh, many more than ever. today and their names are on our church roll Friend, the one that really matters is when you have your name in the Lamb's book of life that shall not be blotted out. That's the one that's kept above and is 100% accurate.